All right. Hello again. We just had a little talk before we got on here. Excited, excited. The gospel is exciting. It just is. I mean, I just get so jacked when I read the word. When you, you know, problem is I think, and I can't say this, speak for everybody, but we read it too fast and we don't think about what we're reading. And we've seen these little words in there. We talked about until last time, you know, that until, do something until. That, there's scripture in there about that this time. But anyway, we're going to get going. <clears throat> Remember in the first chapter, Paul talks about his conversion, Christ in him. When he, he, he was realized that Christ was in him before he ever knew Christ. That's why he does Colossians 126, the mystery that is hidden from ages and generations, Christ in us. And he was so radically transformed for this. He didn't go seek out Peter, Paul, and John, and Mary, and everybody else. Is that a band? Yeah. I'm just teasing Peter, Paul, and Mary. And what did he do? He went to Arabia to be by himself to discover what Christ in him. He already knew the scripture because he's a Pharisee. And in chapter two, he talks about how Peter, again, withdrew to the old message because of what peer pressure. And then chapter three is mind blowing about how did you receive the power of God and the Holy Spirit and all these miracles? Was it because of your morality and your good works or was it just believing, hearing a message? That's key, by the way. I would stick on that and think about that scripture. I, I mean, my suggestion, every time you read this, go back and read that scripture. In fact, I'm going to bring it up this time. And now we're into the analogy, into the analogy of law and grace. Okay, and, this, and think about this. You know, is it funny how we debate this? We have a Pharisee who's steeped in it, who went to Harvard and has the best teacher at the top of his class. He's the one saying, abandon it. And here we are, trying not to abandon it. Because we need a couple rules. No, we, I mean, you face to face with Jesus. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. He is pure, perfect theology. Looking at him. Anyway, here we go. I love this. Infant heirs. Now there was a little baby. Have no more say than a slave, even though they own everything. Now think about that. Infant babies have no more say in the inheritance than a slave, even though they own everything. The infant baby owns everything. A slave doesn't. Second verse. He who remains under domestic supervision and, and house rules. Who does? Who remains the infant heir? Remains under domestic supervision and house rules until when? The day fixed by his father for his official graduation to the status of what? Sonship. Say, I have graduated to sonship. There's no male, no female. You've heard me say this. If I can be the bride of Christ, you gals can be the sons of God. Ugly bride that I am. Need some hair extensions. Anyway, I'm just going to flip over to Ephesians 2 where it talks about adoption. It's beautiful here. In Ephesians 1, 5, it says, He, God, is the architect of your and my design. His, his heart's dream realized are what? Coming of age in Christ. That's the word for adoption. It's not adoption in the way we think of it. You're an outsider. You came into a family that you didn't belong to. You have no genetic makeup. With. No. It's like he says here, the coming of age. It's like being bar mitzvah. To be bar mitzvah is, is coming of age. You're, you're an infant. All of a sudden, you become an adult. You come to realize you're coming of age. Does that make sense? Anyway. Three. This is exactly how it was with us. Now, listen to this. This is beautiful. Think about it. He says, we were kidnapped as if in infancy. Now, think about that. Being kidnapped as an infant, you wouldn't know any better, would you? Imagine if someone, you kidnapped a child, hypothetically, and you brought them into their house. It's a little baby. They were raised that way. They would think that's just normal for them, wouldn't they? You were, he says, we were kidnapped as if in infancy. It's a little baby. And what? confined to the state through the law confined jail and then the commentary says an inferior mindset as a result of adam's fall as a result remember in the fifth chapter of romans you should read it it's great it's because of adam that sin entered the world and because of adam it spread to all men righteousness came into the world through one man christ and it spread to all men that's what it says in, i mean and, and we in our Christian thinking, have Adam on a pedestal. He's all-powerful. We have no problem believing 
that sin spread to all men because of one man's fall, but we sure have a problem believing that the Son of God, the creator of the world, God himself, could only like spread righteousness to like a 30% of the population. Read it. Read it. Read it. Good stuff. And you know, in, in, in Romans it says, even if nobody else believes that God does. I mean, I mean, God's the one that believed that Abraham's wife was going to have a baby when she was totally barren and postmenopausal. He is the one that believed that Mary, who was a virgin, was going to have a baby, the son of God. So he believes, is it Romans 4, 17? He speaks, even though it isn't as it is and it must be. And it's always impossible. For us, anyway. But then, I love this, the day dawned. It reminds me of Proverbs 4, 18, where it says, the light of the righteous becomes brighter, brighter, even onto the full strength, onto the noonday. It says, but then the day dawned. And it was, it was Wednesday. Now Thursday, the day dawned. It was the next day. The day dawned, the most complete culmination of time. Think about that. The most complete culmination of time. That's why we have AD and BC. It's pivotal. Everything predicted, now listen to this. Everything predicted in the Old Testament about Christ was concluded in Christ. Isn't it funny? The Old Testament, remember Jesus said, and I've said this over and over. He says, you Pharisees, you study the scriptures because you believe in them. You have eternal life. And those scriptures speak of what? Me, of Christ. So if you look at the Old Testament, think about who they're pointing to. They're not pointing to you. They're pointing to Christ. And then Christ points to who? You. He's the incarnation, God living in a man. In the flesh, in Carney. The sun arrived. Hallelujah. Commissioned by the Father. Now, in Isaiah, remember the scripture, I think it's the sixth chapter, but I can't remember off the top of my head. It said, Who will go for us, Elohim? Who will go for us? And he says, I will go. Send me, Isaiah. That's prophetically. The Father, Son, Spirit are talking to each other. This is how we can understand it. And they're looking at each other. Who will go for us? They already know who's going to go, by the way. But who will go for us? And Jesus says, I'll go. That's, that's what that means. He said, I will go. And that's, and you think about it. What's so beautiful about that. You know, we always use that scripture, you know, man shall leave his father, mother, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But think about it. You got the Father, and you got the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, and you, most of you know this. In the Old Testament, in Hebrew, it's ruach, which is feminine. In Aramaic, the spoken language of the time of Jesus was feminine. In Greek, it is not he, but it is not she either. It's neutral, even though they put he in the, in the scripture. So you got a father, an, a masculine, and you got a feminine part, and then you got a son. And the son leaves to cleave to who? His bride, us. And we become what? One flesh. He becomes incarnate in who? Me and you. So he's incarnate. He's living in me. He's expressing himself through me. The agape of God is oozing out of every pore of my skin. Right now, that's what he believes. Who? His legal passport to the planet was his mother's womb. Remember that scripture? I can't remember. It's in Corinthians somewhere. Where it says, and I've been to Bible studies all over. The women get all upset about this one. It says, through labor pains, she'll come your salvation. And they'll, oh, that's not fair. Yeah, of course. Jesus came through labor pains. That's the point of the story. <laughs> his legal passport to the planet was his mother's womb. Now listen to this. Catch this. In a human body, exactly like yours. He came in a human body exactly. Say it exactly like mine. No different. He lives his life subject to the same scrutiny of the law. He, now it's, I'm going to flip over here to Romans, there. Where's it there? eighth chapter, third verse. Eight, Romans eight three says, "The law of Moses failed to be anything more than an instruction manual." Say the law of Moses. People need to know this. The law of Moses failed to be anything more. Than an instruction manual. Say it had no power in my life to deliver me from the strong influence of sin holding me hostage in my body. Listen to this. God disguised himself. 
in his son. Remember in 2 Corinthians, is it 5? It says, it was God present in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God didn't abandon, turn around on the cross just because he said a little, sang a little song. Psalms 22, it's a song. They all knew it's a song of ascent. When he started in saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the song of the cross. Everybody would be, it'd be the same as, you know, amazing grace. What are y'all going to do? Oh, sweet, the sound. In other words, that would trigger their mind into the song. They all knew it. It was pointing to him. That's the point. In the 16th chapter, John says, Father, they've all abandoned me, but you will never abandon me. So don't go there with God turned his back. He did not. He was present in Christ, reconciling, grabbing the whole earth in a big old hug. That's what he was doing. Regardless of what you've heard in the past. Anyway. Where, where am I at? Three. God disguised himself in a son in the very domain where what sin ruled us. In the flesh. The body he lived and conquered in was no different than yours. Thus, sin's authority in the human body was past tense conquered. Say it's sin in my body has been conquered. Jesus' flesh is just like my flesh. My flesh is just exactly like his flesh. If it's not lining up, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Just believe it. He believes it. You know, think about it. God believes that you have the same kind of flesh that Jesus does. And maybe it's not doing something you should. Well, just, I think it's, uh, to 8.11 Romans, it says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, it will give life to your short-lived mortal body. The Holy Spirit wants to give life. He's not just resurrected your spirit. He's resurrected everything. He's given life to everything. All right. Now listen to this. This is great. His mandate. What, why was he sent? We're going to find out right here. Was to rescue the human race. How, how many people was he going to rescue? Just a few? I mean, I've had this discussion with my beautiful bride here. I think, you know, the way we think, you know, if there's so many Christians in the earth, right now, there's 8 billion people. I mean, honestly, God got probably 25% of them, not much of a salvation. And Adam affected everybody. And he's a man. Well, we have choices, I know. God did something without your choice. He resurrected you. Ephesians 2, verse 1, while you were dead in your trespasses and sins, what did God do? He raised you up with Christ, gave you the life of Christ, and gave you joint seating equal with the Father, face to face. What state were you in? Dead in your trespasses and sins. Not after you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and went to the altar. You just woke up. It's, that's the problem. The revelation is waking up to what already has happened. The good news. Good news announcement. Good news. Like Francois says, news has already happened. It's not going to happen. It's happened. We just haven't read the, read the good newspaper yet. We're reading it now. Anyway, the mandate was to rescue the human race from what? The regime of the law of performance and announce. Okay, one, the law rescues from the law of performance. Got to go over to Hebrews 6 1. My lovely wife brought this scripture to me right before the Bible study, which is so powerful. So, one, he came to, where am I? Rescue the whole human race from the regime of the law of performance. Say, so he came to rescue me from God pleasing. I'm no longer a God pleasing because God is pleased. God is pleased with the work. You don't believe me? You were included in his baptism. When he was baptized for you as you. And when he came up, what did the father say? This is my son in whom I'm what? well pleased. When the angels, you've heard me say this before. When the angels, I repeat myself a lot. I should not say I said it before because people need to hear it over and over. When the angels sang to the shepherds, they said glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth whom in whom he is well pleased. Say he's well pleased with me. He's pleased with the work of his son. Is a finished work, and he did what you and I could never do. And he's pleased with that work, and we just join in with his pleasure. And yes, you're going to please him, because you're going to get so fall in love with him. You can't, you be a, you're like me, a joy seeker. I mean, because you get totally just enthralled with the truth of the word, and, you know, walking with God, and watching him do things through you, and walking with him, and he's doing it through you. Anyway, listen to six. Consequently, now this is to the Hebrews, not to you unless you're Hebrew. 
as difficult as it may seem, you ought to divorce yourself. Now, you know, when you separate, that's one thing, but divorcing is kind of painful. Divorce yourself from the sentimental attachments of the foreshadowing doctrines of Messiah. In other words, all the predictions which were designed. Why were they designed? All these predictions of Messiah to carry the Jews like a vessel over the ocean of prophetic dispensation into what? The complete fulfillment of promise. When Christ came, he came to fulfill the promise. Remember, we talked about the Testament. God's the tester. He made a, a will and testament through Abraham. And then what did he do? He came and died. And the Testament is only a future promise until there is a death. And now there's an inheritance because he died and was raised from the dead. A mind shift from attempting to impress God to a realizing the faithfulness of God. Is fundamental. There is no life left in the law for you law lovers out there. And there's a few of you. There is no life left in the law. It is dead and gone. You have to move on. And he's talking to the Jews, my Lord. These are people, this is our culture. I mean, talk about, he had to say the word divorce because that's hard. I was raised in a church, I'm telling you, to get out of the traditions of the guilt that it came with. It took me a while. Years, not just a couple sessions. All right. Excuse me. Verse four, we're really making a lot of progress. To seal our sonship. My, oh, no, I did. I was, okay, sorry. I, I got it back to verse five. To, re, to rescue the human race from what the regime of the law performance and to announce the re revelation or the unveiling of your true sonship, sons and daughters, inheritors. Remember, the law made slaves. Grace and truth make sons and daughters inheritors. You're an inheritor of God. You're a son and daughter. He, you always were a son and daughter, but you didn't know it. Up there, it says you were infant heirs, not a slave, but you're now revealed, bar mitzvahed, Revealed as who you really are. True sonship. Say, I have true sonship. That's why Christ came. So he'd reveal my true sonship now, not someday. And it says here in the commentary, now our true state of sonship is again realized. A little bit. I just kind of pick out a few things I like to talk about. Down, man. Eh, well, the lower third, it says, the most accurate, this is the most accurate, tangible display of God's eternal thought. The most accurate tangible something you can touch display of god's eternal thought finds expression where in human life god incarnate in jesus christ and now incarnate in you the reason you're the body of christ is because he lives in you just like he lived in jesus christ lives in you the father lives in you and the spirit live in you now and I've said this over and over, but there's a Hindu guy that puts him on, made all the Christians mad, but it was so beautiful. What if God, in all his wisdom, hid himself in the last place people would look in themselves? Colossians 3, is a 311, Christ is all and he is in all. The history, Colossians 126, the mystery that's hidden from ages and generations long ago, Christ in you, he's there already. Ephesians 4, 6, there's one father of us all, reigning over us all, living in us all. Living in you. Woo! And it says the Spirit's been poured out in who? Everybody's living in you. The whole Godhead is in bodily form in you right now. And he wants you to discover that. So I used to be like an advocate of looking up instead of looking down when you pray. But now I look down, not because of humbleness, because that's where he's living in me. Not up there. He's living here. You know, we're trying to get to heaven. He's did a whole lot of stuff to come here. Why don't we enjoy him while he's here? Because this is where you, just so you know, you, when you go to heaven, maybe there's a or paradise. There's a lot less distractions going on to get your mind away from it. You're never going to get closer than you are from God, the whole Godhead right now, because they're all living in you and they're in union with you. You can't get closer. I mean, you can't. It's impossible. The problem is we haven't wrapped our night, had a, we haven't wrapped our minds around that, our, the metanoia moment. Okay, to seal our sonship. Oh, what does God do? He commissions the spirit of sonship, this Holy Spirit, to do what? Resignate, echo the Abba or Father echo 
where in our hearts, in our hearts. I'm doing the Bill Johnson pause, it's so effective. Guy's a great speaker. Notice this, he's echoing in our hearts. In our innermost being, see this, say this, in my innermost being, I recognize him as my true and very dear father. Wow. I recognize him as my innermost being, the Holy Spirit, testifying with my spirit that I'm what, a child of God. I'm going to read that. He, Francois talks about that in the commentary, but I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Romans 14 through 16 says, the original life of the father, this is this is now. This isn't someday. We're always doing the someday thing in Christianity. This is now. The original life of the Father, the, the original life of the Father revealed in the Son is the life the Spirit now is conducting where? In you. I would say that is good news. Think about that. The same life that that God revealed in the Spirit, in the Son, Jesus, is the same life he's, he's revealing in you right now. He's conducting in you. That's even better. Slavery, remember we got a slave and son, is a poor substitution for sonship. You got a slave and a son. The, they are opposites. Slavery is one that's led forcefully through fear, while sonship responds fondly to Abba. Oh, Father, I'm so fond of you. I love you. I can't get enough of you. In his presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures. Forevermore, and I said this last week, we are made for pleasure. We are made for pleasure. That's why we're pleasure seekers. And the only true pleasure is the face-to-face -face encounter with the Father, Son, Spirit. That's where the true pleasure is. We are not slaves to a cruel taskmaster, <clears throat> which is the Old Testament, but gifted. Oh, if you're wondering where I am, it's, I'm in Romans 8, 14 through 16. Uh, but we are gifted. Say, I am gifted with a spirit of sonship. Say, I am gifted now with a spirit of sonship. I'm engaging. Say, I'm engaging the tender affection of Papa without any reserve. Holy Spirit, 16. Oh, where'd it go? Where's it? Holy Spirit personally entwines your spirit. Say, so entwines my spirit personally, resonating ceaseless, ceaselessly within you, endorsing Abba's parenthood that you are a child and you're an inheritor with Christ, and Christ owns everything. All right, verse seven. <clears throat> Can you see how foolish it would be for a son to continue to live his life as with slave mentality? In other words, I'm under these rules. The father's a fearful taskmaster. I need to please him. I mean, how many of your little kids are three years old are trying to please you? I mean, I know they do nice things for you, but they're kind of like into their own thing. And they don't go to the refrigerator going, can I have permission? They don't jump in your lap thinking, would you really, would you really let me sit in your lap? They just do, right? That's, that's who we are. We're children. We just jump in Papa's lap. Yeah, it's verse seven. Can you see how foolish it would be for a son to continue to live his life with a slave mentality? Question mark. Your sonship qualifies you to what? Say my sonship qualifies me to immediate participation in what? All the wealth of God's inheritance, which is mine. Why? Because of Christ. Not because of you and your good works or your, your denied because of your bad works, because of Christ, because of the finished work, because of the cross, because of the death, resurrection, and ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's why. That's called faith. We believe in that. We believe in what God accomplished. We believe what God, putting on the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, putting on the mind of Christ, believing what God believes to be true about us, regardless of the contradictions in our life. We, if everything was working out perfectly and we were perfect beings, perfect morality, did everything right, we would need no faith. We'd back, be relying on ourselves and we'd back to fall again. Anyway, 
Verse uh, 8. What really amazes me, this is Paul talking to the Galatians, remember this is a Gentile church, is how gullible you Gentile believers are. And the word, I just looked up the word gullible. You know, you use the words for your whole life and then you find, you know, maybe I should look that up again. It says, deceived easily or cheated. Deceived easily. How amazing, what amazes me is how easily you're cheated and deceived or gullible you Gentile believers are to get yourself, listen to this, you ready? All tangled up in oppressive Jewish rites. Oppressive. Oppressive Jewish rites. I know that, you know, you can get all upset with this gospel. This is Paul's gospel, and that's why people got upset. Because of this stuff, they got upset. You, you know, how many times you get flogged and beaten and stoned, jailed. <laughs> you were saying this, uh, they weren't happy. But this is the gospel. This is what set you free. This will help you start seeing how much God loves you, and you start loving yourself. And it says you, he says you, he said we're to love one another as we love ourselves. When we start seeing ourselves from God's perspective. We turn it on our neighbor and start seeing them from His perspective as ourselves. Wow. I can love them, and I can look at their mistakes and say what Jesus said: "Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do." Right, and I can walk. Well, God, I can walk in 1 Corinthians 13 then. I mean, you know all about your BC days or before Christ days of slavery to imaginary gods under of, or under pagan beliefs. And I want to, I'm going to flip over to, I mean, the Romans. The Romans are, let's see here. I want to just read this about, remember he's talking about the law and the Jewish law, but then he kind of talks about people who don't believe in the Judaism. And he talks about, it's Romans 2, 10 through 14. He says, in sharp contrast to this, to the people that you know were raised in the law, the Hebrew people, it says bliss, self worth, and total tranquility is witnessed by everyone, both Jew and Greek, who find expression in which was good. We are tailor made for good. Okay, God does not judge this verse eleven people on face value. Ruin and self destruction. Well, I'm the right stuff here. Yeah, ruin and self destruction are the invisible result of sin, whether someone knows the law or not. Ruin and self destruction are the inevitable result of sin, whether someone knows the law or not. Now remember, the law didn't come until 430 years after Abraham. There was no law. There was, though, in their minds, in their conscience. Now he's talking about the people who don't know the law. Righteousness is not a hearsay thing. It is a faith-inspired practical living, giving new definition to the law. It's the law of the spirit of life. Romans 8. Now for even a pagan's natural instinct will confirm the law to be present in their conscience through though they have never heard about Jewish laws. Thus they prove to be a law unto themselves. In other words, they have a morality, a right and wrong, even if they never heard Jewish laws. The law is so much more than a mere written code. Its presence in the human conscience, even in the absence of written instructions, is obvious, condemning and commending. In other words, personal per you're good when you do this. You're bad when you do this. But we are not under that anymore. We're under what God believes to be true about us. He is the tree of life. We're face to face. He defines us. The law doesn't define us. Christ defines us now. All right. Got done with page one? We're almost done. Only going into like 17. So, In the meantime, <clears throat> listen, this. you have come to know the real God. And then he's talking to the Gentiles or to the Galatians because he says, quite unlike your God of your imagination. What is most significant, however, and this is so beautiful, is to discover that he, God, knew you all along. Say, God knew me all along, ever before I ever knew him. And he was totally in love with me. He sent the Savior to change me, to bless me. I'm in verse 9. Think about that. I mean, I, when I came to Christ, I was blind as a bat. I mean, I had no clue. And all of a sudden, I met the Lord. My life changed. I was like, oh, my God, there's a brand, whole new world out there I didn't know existed. And he knew me, and he, he's okay with me. That blew me away because I thought if I, I didn't know if he was real or not. I went to church all the time. But if I met him, I was screwed. Screwed. Got to say it like a Brit. I was screwed. <laughs> right? It was was not going to go well for me, but of course I was a. I had the legalism in my mind. 
but now I have grace and faith in my mind. Christ defines me. He is my, you know, as 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, is God has made Christ to be your wisdom. It is from God. This, here, here, it all goes. here it goes. It is from God that you have your life in Christ, not from yourself. Who he has made your righteousness, your wisdom, your sanctification, your holiness. Those things are because of him. He's made those onto you. You don't have your own righteousness. You have his. You don't have your own holiness. You have his. You don't have your own sinlessness or forgiveness. You have his. You don't have even your own wisdom. You got something better? You got his. And he's God, by the way. All right. In the meantime, okay. What is, okay. After all, this is verse nine. After all, how could you possibly feel attracted again? Again, now think about that. They came out of these, you know, some Jewish people in here, but a lot of them came out of pagan religion. They heard the gospel. They're excited. And now what do they want to do? Because of Jewish believers out of Hebrews, that's, that's, you just read Hebrews. That's the people they came from are trying to pin them down again to Jewish rituals. You need to be saved. Otherwise, you're not going to heaven. You got to go to the Sabbath. You got to get circumcised. Bum, 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 bum. It says, after all, how could you possibly feel attracted again to, listen to this, pathetic, pathetic principles of religious deception? Principles, pathetic principles, of, he calls it religious deception. This is the Apostle Paul. This is not Pat Emery. This is not Francois Dutoy. He's just good, a good rendition of what Paul said through the Greek, paraphrased. And you know, oh, and I used to be this dumb. Oh, we've got to have that uh, transliteral. If you've been enough around enough countries, you know that there are some things that do not translate. I don't know, I don't know how many times I've heard this. God, there's no way of saying that in English in our country. There's no way of saying. So you got to have a way to say it. It does not matter in what disguise legalism comes, whether it is pagan or Jewish, it brings the same bondage. We read back here. It said they had a law unto themselves. Whether the law is written, it's in our minds. And it came, the law came to express, remember the last chapter, or it was in this chapter. I can't remember. I think it was designed to see how to sink we were and to lead us to who? Christ. And if it makes us turn away from that to Christ, we're looking at a new thing and don't go back. That's if you ask me, it says don't, you know, don't look back. That's what you don't look back to. And if you want to do some self-examination, don't be self-examining all your mistakes. Examine, do I have any legalistic thinking in my life? That's what, and then Lord, show me and remove it. Because I just want to see myself, how you see me in my perfect image and likeness of what you speak over me and declare by faith. Verse 10, all of a sudden there is special days, months, seasonal and annual festivals that are what? Scrupulously celebrated. This is nothing more than superstitious religious sentiment. Go back to Hebrews 6 1. Loving that chapter. Look at that verse today. You know, I may sound like a radical. I am. 6 1. Consequently, let me say it again. As difficult as it may seem, you ought to what? Divorce yourselves. From your sentimental attachment to the foreshadowing doctrine of Christ. That's what a lot of these celebrations. Of course, he's talking about Jewish and pagan here. Divorce yourself. Which was designed to what? To carry you through the prophetic dispensation until Christ came. He is the fulfillment of all these promises. You want to, def Christ defined you. He's the incarnation. They all predicted that moment. The culmination of history. Christ came, di died, was raised. The Holy Spirit. And then after that, when the Holy Spirit came, we were in the last day. And we've been in the last day for 2,000 years. That's one John. I, I can't quote the scripture right now, but that's we're in the last day. John says we know we're in the last day because many antichrists have come up from our, our, uh, our group. Anyway, I am alarmed that all my passion seems wasted on you. In other words, all the time I spent. I urge you, verse 12. To imitate me in my conviction about the fact that Jewish customs and their shadow sediments are out of date. We are exactly in the same boat. 
it is really not about me. It is about you. Our Jewish and Gentile backgrounds make absolutely no difference. Verse thir- you know, it's, you know, you got to think about uh, Galatians, or Galatians 2.20. Paul says, and this is included us, I have been crucified with Christ. This is the finished work. I no longer live. And the life I live, I live by what? By the faith of God, what God believes to be true, who died and loved me. And most Bible scholars don't believe have the faith in God, the faith of God. Because remember in Hebrews, or excuse me, Hebrews 12, 2, it says faith has origin. He is the author and perfecter. It comes, faith comes from him. All right. I have never compromised the gospel. I love this. Paul, I mean, of all the people, seriously, I really want to meet Paul. I mean, that guy was tough. Let's see, I'm going to flip over another scripture here. Too far over. But he says, I've never compromised the gospel from the first time, first day I met you, even though I was physically challenged at the time, it did not distract I d- it did not distract from the message. Now, over in Galatians, uh, is it 2.5? Two fi- uh, two it says, we want you to know that we are sold out to keep the gospel undiluted. And the gospel has been diluted over the 2,000 years. It was already getting diluted from them. Here's Paul preaches the message of pure grace, pure faith, pure new covenant, and the Judaizers is coming in and diluting the gospel. That's why this is important. He says, we are sold out for the, to keep the gospel undiluted for your sake. Had we compromised the message even so slightly to accommodate their opinion, which is the Judaizers, the whole Gentile world would have felt cheated. And we have been cheated. We see such a future for the pure gospel. Which brings me to Galatians 3.5 because it's a key. Now this is what happens when the pure gospel is preached. You ready? Galatians 3.5. Would you accredit what you received from God to something you did or something you heard? It's something you heard. Did God reward you for your high moral standards? No. When he worked, what did he do? Worked extravagant miracles. Not just miracles, extravagant miracles. In you. And lavished. Poured out without excess, without measure. The spirit upon you. Or did it perhaps have anything to do with the content of the revelation of the message of grace? That you have heard. That's the key. Faith is the source of God's action on mankind's behalf. Faith is what God believes. Agreeing with God. Our hearing is a conduit of what God's faith reveals. Hearing a message has got power. In the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the 12th verse, the message spoken in Christ is the most life-giving and dynamic influence where? Within us. All right. Then he goes on. Verse 14, remember how hospitable and sensitive you were towards me in spite of my frail condition. Obviously, he wasn't doing well physically. Instead of feeling embarrassed or repelled, you treated me like a celestial, an angel, a celestial messenger with the same courtesy you would have shown if Christ Jesus himself showed up. At this time, you were so overwhelmed with gratitude towards me, not just gratitude, overwhelming gratitude, so I like, Thank you very much. That was very nice. No, wow. Man. Thank you. Thank you. You ever did that? You get really excited. You go, I mean, sometimes we'd say thank you. That was really kind. Somebody go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's overwhelming gratitude. Gratitude towards me that you would have gladly given me your most, pre- most pre- what is most precious to you, even your own eyes. To give me relief for my discomfort. What tenderness of affection you showed. Verse 16. Alas, and listen to this. This message, he says, How is it possible that the same truth, the same truth that then bound you to me now turns me into your enemy? The people who make me out to be your enemy do that to your disadvantage. Any of you like to be disadvantaged? Mixed law and grace, you're disadvantaged. They are very eager to isolate you from me so that their zeal for the Jewish sentiments will boost their religious ego, their religious egos. The end. Pause.